the Tex Public Policy Foundation. Um, I work in the Center for Fiscal Policy, so budget issues, taxes, things of that nature. But my dissertation and much of my research is in the energy area, how energy prices affect the overall economy and, and things of that nature. Um, let's kind of open it up here with this session. Um, a recent statement by Treasury Secretary Jack Lew, I think really captures the administration's view and also the, um, <clears throat> the overall environmental and climate change enthusiasts quite succinctly when he said, and I quote, as an economics matter, the cost of inaction or delay is far greater than the cost of action. I don't think we can stop where we are. We're going to keep putting policies into place. Politically, I'm not sure you wanna wait until the public stands up and demands action because it'll be too late when people are feeling it that personally. Um, these bring up two key concepts, one being precautionary, the precautionary principle, that we need to do something today for what may happen in the future. Climate change may have caused these catastrophic events, so we need to act today, um, not considering maybe all the costs and all uh, that, that would come from climate change and how to measure those social costs, but also looking at the benefits of using fossil fuels that we've seen throughout history. In addition, it, doesn't, it also doesn't consider the opportunity costs of what actions may be taken um, by this top-down approach. And those are important as we consider all of economic history and the amount of, the number of people that have been, been moved out of poverty and into prosperity from fossil, fossil fuel use um, throughout human history. Since 2008, right, in 2008, the price of oil hit a peak of $145 per barrel. And, and that really opened up kind of the floodgates of bringing about these high cost techniques such as hydraulic fracturing to bring about more oil production. And, um, and, and, and over this period, we've seen a boom here in the state of Texas. Since the last recession, December of 2000 session, uh, 2007, the rest of the United States, excluding Texas, is still, still employs fewer people than they did in December 2007. <laughs> However, on the other hand, Texas employs 1.1 million more people than they did during, uh, since December 2007. So in fact, we have seen a boom here in the state of Texas, and part of that, a large part, is due to the oil and gas sector. Um, and so today, what we really want to answer is, what is the history of global warming? How has the political realm influenced energy markets, and therefore this global warming I idea? What are the economic costs and benefits of a top-down government approach relative to a market-driven approach? Um, so we have uh, three great panelists here. Um, one being Rupert Darwall, um, author, the author of the acclaimed book, The Age of Global Warming, A History. He spent time at Cambridge and worked at the Conservative Research Department, then in the financial sector. Um, he's an accomplished author of commentaries in major UK and US publications. And he has a wealth of knowledge on the history of global warming. And we're happy that you're, you're here with us today. We also have Stephen Moore, uh, chief economist with the Heritage Foundation, a contributor at the Wall Street Journal, and a daily, comment, um, daily, daily Fox News economics commentator. He has worked for two presidential commissions. He's an author of six books, with the latest being Who's the Fairest of Them All? The Truth About Taxes. Holds in a master's degree in economics from George Mason University. And so there are a few that can explain the combination of economics and global warming and these overall effects of regulations um, better than, than Steve Moore. And finally, we have Mark Morano, um, executive director and chief correspondent for the award-winning ClimateDepot.com. He was named one of the only five uh, quote-unquote criminals against humanity, against planet Earth itself. Uh, <laughs> a badge of honor, if you will. <laughs> um, he spent time working in, for a U.S. senator for three years, has years of climate change research under his belt as well. Recently spent time at the climate march in D.C., which you may or might hear a little bit about that. Um, and his experience provides valuable insight into political nature of global warming. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Um, Rupert? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Are you okay? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lars. It's, it's terrific to be here. It's terrific to be with this uh, great group, and it's uh, terrific to be in this great state. You've done me a great honor um, inviting me to participate with such a distinguished panel. I've known Steve, uh, thanks to, through one of the greatest human beings, the most inspiring human beings, Art Lapper. And Mark Marana, it is a privilege to meet you, a true carnivore amongst herbivores, right at the top <laughs> of the food chain of this, uh, the, uh, the warmest turn and flea at the prospect of debating him. This subject reminds me of the famous comment 
of Oscar Wilde when he first saw the Niagara Falls and was asked what he thought of them, it would be more interesting if it flowed the other way because that is essentially what we're looking at today. We're trying to roll back uh, the Industrial Revolution to repeal 200 years of uh, progress of civilization. Um, the idea that this should happen is obviously inherent, it's, it's obviously very fascinating why people should believe such an extraordinary idea, and it's obviously absurd to try and bring it back, as the last panel uh, have been demonstrating. At the core of my book is, the proposition about, is a proposition about global warming. The science is weak, the idea is strong. The history of ideas is very important uh, uh, in this field because, for, because scientists dominate the discourse. And scientists have a, in general, have a cultural aversion to learning from the past. For, the, for them, the past is a closed book, only the future matters. And, and uh, it means that they don't learn from the previous falsifications of, of various predictions made uh, by eminent scientists. In 1972, for example, a group of British scientists put their names to a, a, a pamphlet called A Blue Blueprint for Survival. It forecasts that civilization would come to the, an end within the lifetime of people then living. Similarly, the Club of Rome's limits to growth. Um, those predictions all been false, falsified. Bert Berlin, the first chairman of the uh, Intergovernmental Pilot, uh, uh, Panel on Climate Change, acknowledged that global warming was not something you can prove. So the strength of the science is not sufficient to explain how what's, what was, for much of the 20th century, a little more than a scientific curiosity, came to define an age. And that requires an explanation outside the science, specifically the rise of environmentalism. And environmentalism is an ideology. From Marxism, it borrowed the concept of alienation, this time the rich man's alienation from the means that made him rich. Marxism was about changing class relations with the means of production. Environmentalism goes even further. It demands a change in the means of production themselves, a far more radical proposition. Its economics draw, drew on uh, pre-existing ideas, Malthus, and his notion of sin, punishment, and redemption as a, redu as a result of overpopulation, and fears of resource depletion. Environmentalism's war against fossil fuels and its obsession with renewable energy can be traced back to Fritz Schumacher and his extraordinary book, Small is Beautiful. And the sudden emergence of environmentalism as a political movement in the post-war world can be dated with precision to 1962 and publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. In reality, Silent Spring is a work of fiction and all the more powerful for that. I would go so far as to say that Silent Spring is the most consequential book of the post-war era. Just 10 years separates uh, Silent Spring from the first UN uh, conference on the environment, which was in Stockholm in 1972. But to make that happen, environmentalism needed one further idea, and that idea is the preeminent role of science. Science should be mobilized to save the planet. Science as global therapeutics. It was brought into this mix, weaponized, if you like, uh, by quite possibly, the most, uh, quite possibly the most influential person you've never heard of, Barbara Ward, who added to all that a massive, uh, put, 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 put a program of massive resource transfer to the, existed, to the developing world. If I give you one name, you'll get a flavor of her politics and her belief in redistribution. Lyndon Johnson said that hers was the only books he, he read, writing to her two days before he left the White House, whatever mark we've made in these last five years clearly bears your stamp too. Ward believed in global planning. It is surely inconceivable, she said, that we should turn the whole human experiment over to forces of change which we can neither master nor fully understand. However, science is paying a very steep price for its political preeminence. Because climate science became the leading branch of glo global therapeutics, it made climate science too big to fail. And in doing so, it made science antithetical, it made climate science antithetical to science itself. As a result of rising concern about the potential results of the incomplete geophysical experiment of releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the world has embarked on a political experiment of unprecedented scale and scope. 
But here's the catch. Simultaneously with the rise of environmentalism in the first world, we had the rise of a development agenda in the third world. And the third world has been absolutely clear from the word go, from 1972, in fact, that they will not be fettered by the first world's environmental concerns. So if you look at the 1992 UN Climate Change Convention, it created a bifurcated uh, regime between the developed and the developing nations. In that regime, there is no graduation mechanism. Developing nations can develop as much as they like, but they will never become developed nations. So what's all this about? What's the bottom line? Speaking at the 2007 Bali Climate Conference, former Vice President Al Gore told climate delegates that they should feel privileged, quote, to be, to be alive at a moment when a relatively small group of people could control the destiny of all generations to come. Global warming, therefore, involves the oldest question in politics. Who governs? An open society, the philosopher Karl Popper wrote, is one that not merely tolerates dissenting opinions, but respects them. Democracy, that is, that is a form of government devoted to the protection of the open society, cannot flourish if science becomes the exclusive possession of a closed set of specialists. In the 1620s, the, the political philosopher Francis Bacon argued that the, I've got, I've got one more minute, uh, the uh, republic should be governed by scientists. A, generat a generation later, John Locke's political philosophy, philosophy is based on the Socratic ins insight that to err is human, one that is applicable both to politics and science. The Constitution of the United States is the fullest and most perfect embodiment of Locke's philosophy. It was during the age of global warming that the West came closest to realizing Bacon's vision of rule by scientists. There is one country, however, that held firm. And it is no accident that for many years the United States was the only country in which there was any political debate on the science of global warming, that there was any economic analysis of the costs of trying to decarbonize the, the, their economy. America's political culture, ultimately the American Constitution, ensured debate, discussion, and dissension. Long may that continue. Thank you, Mr. Dawal. Mr. Verano. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> delight to be here today. Uh, as I mentioned, I just came, I mentioned earlier, I just came from the People's Climate March in New York City, and that was a trip. Uh, I can't explain. Uh, let me give you one, one example. This is how the march began in New York City. I kid you not. It started in Columbus Circle, and within 30 seconds, this is what all the marchers were greeted with, as the opening salvo, if you will. Everyone had to be quiet. They were doing a, a massive earth vigil at the beginning of the march. And the march, the other thing it began with was in having Naomi Klein, a Seattle socialist city councilman, S Senator Bernie Sanders, and Bill McKibben kick off the night before with a whole event attacking capitalism and praising socialism. And this was the organizers of the event doing this. It was a, it was a um, collection of every interest group on the left, including uh, people who, you know, animal rights and all the way through. I saw women with uh, shirts on with blue lines on their, across their chest saying this is where sea level will be in the year 2100. There was every possible scenario. I have a clip. I interviewed Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And this is a message uh, that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wants to play. Uh, no, the next one. The next slide. Yeah, there it is. The ne this is a message from the march to everyone in this room today. Go ahead and play this. A little louder if you can. He's talking about energy CEOs. What about politicians, uh, people who deny, who express skepticism? They're selling out the public trust. And, you know, I think those guys who are doing the, the Koch brothers bidding and who are against all the evidence of the rational mind are saying that global warming doesn't exist, that they are contemptible human beings, and that, you know, I wish that there were a law you could punish them under. I don't think there's a, war, a law that you can punish those politicians under, but I, do I think the Koch brothers should be prosecuted for reckless endangerment? Absolutely. That's a criminal offense, and they ought to be serving time for it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, this is energy CEOs he wants to put in jail as war criminals. Average skeptics, he wants to figure out a way the law can punish him. This is not an outlier, outlier position. At this march, they sent out emails warning people that I was attending, filming from my documentary Climate Hustle. They said, do not talk to me, that I will make you look ignorant. I don't think I have to make anyone look anything. They can just let them speak. Uh, but they were very concerned. Uh, they actually, we've gotten at least two emails from people we interviewed revoking priv uh, permission for me to have used them in any documentary or their likeness of any kind. They were, they were very controlled, controlled on the message here. Let me give you a little history. We said this would be about the history of global warming. We hear this a lot. I remember when I was a small boy, the snows were more frequent. People, the snow now is a thing of the past. That was in 1809. Thomas Jefferson said that. Okay, let's go. Considerable change of climate is coming. The Greenland seas have been covered in ice, and now they've disappeared. We've heard all about this. Leonardo DiCaprio mentioned Greenland melting in his UN speech at Tuesday. Oops, 1817, president of the Royal Society. Wait a minute. Okay, uh, let's go a little more recent. Okay. If December passes without snow, we demand what's become of good old-fashioned winners. Remember this thing of the past? This must be the UK uh, house, uh, UK people. Wait, 1912. Okay, two, this is how far back all this silliness goes. A great climatic change was now carrying the world slowly toward worldwide drought. 1914, the Royal Geographical Society. Three consecutive years of drought. Now, this is global warming skeptics. This could be coming from Roy Spencer. This could be coming from Richard Lindzen. Three consecutive years of drought, speculating, conjecturing, even absurdly, it seemed to attribute it to, the, to uh, the reality of the operation of man. They're saying that mankind is causing this drought. That was in 1871. And that was a newspaper finally getting sense and fighting the, the climate alarmists back in the 1870s. Every season is sure to be extraordinary. Does this sound familiar? Almost every month, driest, wettest, windiest. Everything is record-breaking. The weather is extreme. It's like a nature walk through the Book of Revelation, as Al Gore said. 1871. It's incredible. We've actually found and located the first global warming skeptic in 1870. And this, whoever editorial director of the Brisbane Courier was. Even former believers in man-made global warming are now converting themselves. James Lovelock, he literally said that th there are billions of us will die, the few breeding pairs will survive. This was in 2006, 2007. Uh, he's going to be featured prominently in my new documentary, Climate Hustle. He now says he was wrong, we haven't got the physics worked out, environmentalism has become a religion, and religions don't worry too much about facts. The Green Guru, James Lovelock is responsible for the Gaia theory that the Earth's a living, breathing organism, organism completely respected by the global warming uh, community until he converted. Sorry about that. I went too far. What happened to the movement? How did it movement, and we talked about this earlier, predicting prostitution, predicting airline turbulence? That's the basic answer. And Climate Gate was a huge moment of truth. A, I, you could call it a moment of clarity, if you will. Uh, and one of, the one of the scientists, Robert Austin of, uni University of uh, Princeton University, he viewed Climate Gate as fraud, pure and simple. It was the, the top echelon of the United Nations scientists essentially conspiring to craft a narrative on global warming and suppressing dissent. I believe the movement has failed, especially in public opinion, because the, had Al Gore, whether you love him or hate him, he's a divisive political figure. Uh, it just wasn't, he wasn't never going to appeal to the American people. He's gonna only going to have a certain percent, and a certain percent is never going to accept what he says. And having the UN as the source of your science was never going to fly. It's scandal ridden, it's distrusted by the American people. And the United Nations, they always, John Kerry likes to say it's the gold standard of science. Well, I like to say it's fool's gold, if that's the case. And it's been tarnished, uh, especially given the, polit the political agenda. I think I alluded to Richard Toll earlier, le lead author of the report this year. He says his colleagues drifted too far to the alarmist side, and he now says uh, he had his name removed from the report. This is just another example. The idea that climate change poses an existential threat is laughable. UN lead author who just had his name removed from the report. Now, I'm a layman. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I do play one on TV occasionally. Uh, and this is what I, you know, we heard the science panel, but this is probably the best thing for political leaders and lay people to understand. It's from a UK scientist, Philip Stott. Climate change is governed by hundreds of factors or variables. The idea we can manage it predictably by understanding and manipulating at the margins one politically selected factor, CO2, is as misguided as it gets. In other words, 
That, to me, if you were going to find one sentence to argue the case for global warming skepticism, that's it. Co-founder of Greenpeace testified to the Senate, uh, higher temperatures in ice age. We've gone to some of the science. This is the global warming pause. There's now over 50 explanations for the global warming pause. Uh, I kid you not, the oceans ate global warming. Chinese coal use has created this pause. Uh, it just goes on and on, and we may hit 18 years here very soon. And I'll end on this, uh, we're running out of time. Connie Hedegaard, the EU science. This is another key quote to give you the idea of the agenda. Let's say the science is wrong. This is the EU Climate Commissioner. It was not about climate. Would it not in any case have been good to do many of the things you have to in order to combat climate change? In other words, they have an agenda they want to pursue regardless of whether the science is right or not. It's part, it fits their agenda. Naomi Klein, the author, said the exact same thing at the People's Climate March. She realized that climate fears can be used to advance a political agenda. So uh, with that, I'll have some more time in Q&A, but that's all I have time for right now. Uh, I want to show you, uh, at some point, I'm going to show you the trailer to Climate Hustle if we have time at the end. We have a movie trailer, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morano. Mr. Moore. Hi, folks. Um, I think that last point you just made is really the key one, um, that this really isn't about climate change, that, that this is about a, an agenda to, um, to destroy capitalism and to move us towards a more socialist system. You know, I was in, uh, yesterday I was in uh, Pen Pittsburgh for the Marcellus Shale conference. And, uh, and spoke, there were about 1,500 people there, an amazing conference, and it's just, if you wanna see the American revival that's going on in our economy, is, as most of you know, without the energy revolution that's gone on in the last six years, there'd be no recovery at all. And I'm not talking about wind and solar power, I'm talking about the oil and gas revolution that's just transforming the American economy. You all feel it here, obviously, in Texas, where you've tripled your oil and gas output over the last six years. But it's amazing what you, you know, you go to other places like, you know, P Pennsylvania, which, you know, five or six years ago was an incredible depression, uh, you know, with so many industries leaving. And you go to Pitts Pittsburgh, is booming today. It's not much different than Houston. Not, not growing quite as fast as, as Houston is, but amazingly, towns around the entire state of Pennsylvania that were once really poor, that were kind of the armpit of America, are coming back. People are getting rich off of this. It's a, it's a really exciting thing to see, and it's incredibly depressing to see so many people trying to destroy this economic revival. Um, the uh, Obama's speech this week, I thought, was one of the more remarkable uh, speeches I've seen. I've been in, in politics for 30 years. I don't think I've ever seen anything like what the president did when he went to the United Nations this week. Uh, here we are in a situation where we have, uh, we're facing terrorists all over the world. Uh, you know, um, Putin is on the march in Eastern Europe. China is building up its military. The terrorists are being well financed by petrodollars. Um, we've got an e Ebola breakout in the world. We've got an, a world economy that is in a, almost a state of, of depression. And the president actually said at the United Nations conference that he thinks that the biggest threat to the planet today is global warming. And I would make the case to you that's, a, that's almost a derangement syndrome to say something like that. And in fact, it really degrades and undermines our war against terrorism, doesn't it? When the president says, you know, fighting terrorism isn't as important. I mean, I, I just thought it was a, a disgraceful thing to say. So let me, um, let me just make a few quick observations, and then I will. Um, these are just kind of random thoughts, but I want to impress upon you some of the things that, because I do talk about energy everywhere I go, because I think, look, as I said, the energy revolution is the biggest economic story in this country. We would still be in a, in a, in a recession if it weren't for what's happening in states like Texas and Oklahoma and Pennsylvania. So first, um, I, was in, uh, I was in Naples, Florida a few months ago, uh, giving a talk to the Chamber of Congress, and the people said, you know, would you be willing to talk to the, um, to the kids, to these, um, to these kids that were the valedictorians of their high school class? And I thought, gosh, yes, hell yeah, I'd love to do that. And you know, there were about 25 kids, really impressive, inquisitive, just polite. I, I had a really great time talking to them. And you know, these are smart kids. They're all going to you know elite schools, Ivy Leagues, and so on. And uh, I was just talking about the economy, and obviously I talked about the energy revolution. At one point, I mentioned the term fracking, and I said, you know, a lot of this is being made possible by fracking. And I looked out at these kids, and they all started frowning at me. And I, th I thought that's kind of strange. So. I said, wait a minute. I said, uh, you know, how many of you kids in this room 
think that fracking is a good thing? Three of them raised their hands, three. How many of you kids think fracking is a bad thing? 20 of them raised their hands. Now, that's extraordinary, <laughs> actually. And we're talking about one of the greatest technological advances in the last 25 or 30 years. And sure, there are you know, ups and downs. You know, there, there, you know, there are costs with fracking. You had to do something about cleaning the water and so on. And obviously, uh, you know, there, there are some negatives with fracking. But the idea that these kids have been brainwashed with this idea that somehow fracking is a negative thing, it, gives, it, it should be a wake-up call to us that the left is, is indoctrinating kids at a very young age that, that, that fracking and, uh, and this oil and gas development is a bad thing, not a good thing. By the way, after sitting with these kids for 10 minutes kind of explaining it to them at the end of the, my talk, I mean, it doesn't take a long time to, these are smart kids, to, for them to say, yeah, this sounds like it's a very sensible thing, but it gives you a sense of what we're up against. Second of all, how many of you in this room, I bet most of you do, but very few, how many of you know what country in the world over the last five years has reduced its carbon emissions the most? What country is that? The United States, right? Uh, how many of you knew that, by the way? M almost everyone does. Um, by the way, the president said that. One of the few things he got right in his speech the other day, he said, we have reduced our carbon emissions the most. And he's right. We have. What he didn't say was why. <laughs> Anybody know why it is the United States has reduced its carbon emissions the most? Fracking. <laughs> fracking, right? I mean, fracking has caused the biggest reduction in carbon emissions. I just wrote a piece. Uh, the reason I was just a couple minutes late, I wrote a, my, my weekly piece for Investment Business Daily said, Fight global warming with fracking. You know, the left is going to love that, right? <laughs> but if you want to stop, if you're really serious about reducing carbon emissions, then every environmental group in the country should be doing, you know, uh, cartwheels over fracking, right? Because as we've moved towards cheap and abundant and clean natural gas, it has made um, carbon emissions and other emissions that really actually, I don't believe that carbon is a, it, carbon is a pollution. They, they just started, what, how long have they been calling carbon a pollution? I mean, that it never used to, I mean, carbon is not a pollution. Carbon monoxide is a pollution, right? Lead is a pollution. Sulfur is a pollution. Smog is a pollution. You get sick from those things. But carbon, uh, carbon dioxide is not a pollution. It's not something you can get sick over. But in any case, that's an amazing story that we have to get out there, that we can, we can continue to reduce our carbon um, uh, emissions by moving aggressively towards natural gas. Now, here's the interesting thing. The left has turned against natural gas, not just fracking, against natural gas. They liked natural gas. They were all in favor of it, the Sierra Club and these other groups, until fracking came along and it became really cheap and affordable, which is why I think you nailed it. This isn't really about reducing carbon emissions. It's about slowing down economic progress. Um, blue, uh, this may be the most important point, and then, then I'll, I'll kind of turn it over to Q&A. How do we fight this? Because I, I think we're in the fight of our life here. I'm not so sure we're winning, actually. You know, I, I, I'd like to think we're winning, but I, you know, I kind of get the sense we're maybe, we're maybe losing. There's some, se there's some indications that we're winning, some that we're losing. But this is an incredible fight, and the left has done – this is one of the most incredibly effective propaganda campaigns I've ever seen in, in you know, my whole time uh, covering politics. They have, they have somehow put this, this issue on the front burner in a way that is extraordinary, despite the fact, as you just showed, None of the evidence shows that this is even happening, and yet um, this has become something that is the problem, uh, the biggest problem. How do we, how do we attack this? Because that's really what we have to think about. How do we divide and the conquer the left on this? And I want to put a thought in your all head. I call it blues versus greens, blues versus greens, and and here's how it goes. If if you think of uh, some, who is financing the Democratic Party today? It's Tom Steyer, right? Tom Steyer, you all, you all know who Tom Steyer is. He He's giving hundreds of millions of dollars to the Democrats. His agenda, he's all in on the, on, the, on the climate change agenda. And so he's essentially running the Democratic Party today. Harry, uh, you know, uh, Reid does anything he tells him to, and so does Nancy Pelosi. Now, his basic agenda is to stop this revolution that's going on in drilling. And by the way, one of the ramifications of this rev revolution that's going on in drilling is it's provided millions of blue-collar union jobs, pipe-fitting jobs. Uh, welding jobs, trucking jobs, construction worker jobs, electrician jobs. So blue collar manufacturing jobs are coming back in a big way in this country and the epicenter of that revolution is because we have this drilling revolution. Now what Tom Steyer is saying is stop, no more of this, right? No more drilling, no more of these trucking jobs, no more of these welding jobs, no more of these construction jobs and so on. And what we have to do I think as a movement 
is go to these union, the old Reagan blue collar Democrats, right? The people who voted for Ronald Reagan in 1980, a lot of them have abandoned the conservative movement in the Republican Party, and go into the union halls at the, at the Teamsters and the, and the pipe welders and the electricians and the coal miners. By the way, I have to say this is a side, I know I usually work. I live in Virginia. What has happened, I know you're here in Texas, which is obviously oil and gas town. Virginia is a coal state. And what is happening in some of these small towns in, co in Virginia, it's tragic. It would, it, it, he, these new regulations that you were all talking about, they have, ev they have wiped out these entire plants, towns, where third and fourth generation uh, you know, uh, people live there, no longer, ha no longer have the coal mining jobs. So, wait a minute, I thought Barack Obama cared about the working man and woman. My point is, we have to go to these union halls and make a very strong pitch to them that their jobs are the ones that are at stake here. And you know what, it's true, right? The people who are the frontline victims of this radical climate change or agenda are the very blue collar unions that make up the base of the Democratic Party. And so what I've told Republican leaders to do and conservative leaders to do is go to these union halls, and they're starting to do this, and simply make this case. They are the ones who are trying to destroy your jobs we are the ones who are trying to protect your jobs. We have to appeal. Don't you agree with this? We should go repeal right to their pocketbooks on this. Last point. Promise this is the last one. Um, the American people, one reason to think maybe we're not losing. I don't know how many of you saw the polls that came out um, over the last couple of weeks, but there have been a number, an ABC poll, a Fox poll, a, and a CNN poll, and they all show the same thing. They all ask the American people, what is the number one issue that you are concerned about? You all know the answer to that. What, what are people most concerned about today? Jobs and the economy. By the way, that's another reason why sh we should be saying that these, uh, this agenda is anti-jobs. Here's the amazing thing. Do you know what's like number 21 on that list of 25 things? Global warming. People don't care about global warming right now. They just really don't. In fact, the CNN poll found that, you know what percentage of Americans think that global warming is the number one problem in America today? What percentage of Americans agree with Barack Obama? You say two percent, actually three percent. Three percent. Three out of a hundred Americans think this is the number one problem. So we've got to drill this issue that it's about jobs and the economy, and the more we can make, make this point and drive it home that we're the ones for, who are for jobs, we are the ones who are for prosperity, we're the ones for economic progress, and they are the ones who are against it. Because the other thing that the things, that the other finding of the polls that's very interesting, if you ask Americans, do you care about global warming? 70% will say, yeah, yeah, I care. You know, they've been, yeah, they're not gonna say, I don't care about global warming. Do you think it's real? Yeah, I think it's a big problem. We, gotta, we should do something about this. So on that front, the liberals are, are winning. But then, if you ask the American people, okay, are you willing to pay more for electricity to stop global warming? Hell no. We don't want to, no, I'm not going to pay more for electricity. Are you willing to pay higher gasoline prices to stop global warming? Hell no. That's, what we, that's where we defeat them, I think, is by saying this is not free. This is not this whole nonsense about green jobs, that this is going to be good for the economy. That's where we have to attack them because, really, the future of our economy is at stake. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, I think we have some time for a few questions. Please raise your hand, wait for the mic. Anyone? Right here. Hi there. Uh, I just wanted to say that I'm Doug Inflanik with CPAC. I, uh, my question uh, simply is this. Do you see anybody out there uh, on the national scene uh, who is a, a leader uh, in, the, in the country who we can, can articulate these issues very well? I don't see anybody. Yes. Uh, what Stephen said about losing the battle, I think in many ways you, the analogy would be the Vietnam War. We won every major battle from the platoon up, but we lost the war. In this battle, we're winning the science battles. We won all fight, cap, and trade. We fought UN treaties. But along the way, they got smarter in what they're doing and strategically brilliant. We have now EPA regulations that bypass Congress and they're done through executive order. And now we're about to get a UN treaty next year that's gonna bypass Senate ratification. So the whole stage will be set, well, both domestic and international, the next presidency in 2016, which goes right to your question, who will that president be? 
Chris Christie's EPA director is on record as praising President Obama's EPA climate regs. Uh, he was within the week after Obama issued them. I haven't heard Christie directly on it. People like uh, Mitt Romney have had a lot of global warming alarmists on his staff, and he's always he's waffled on it. I don't know that a Republican president, unless they're strong skeptics, is going to come into office in 2016, assuming they won, and start dismantling EPA climate regulations, withdrawing from UN agreements, because typically the history of Republican presidential administrations is the most liberal members of the administration are tossed on the environmental side. We have the, wor the, the worst members are usually the EPA guys. They're usually the Republicans don't want to deal with the environment. They toss a bone. They get the most liberal member, and they want to forget about the environment. So at best, even with a Republican victory, I'm thinking we can only repeal 50 percent of the EPA regs and 50 percent of the UN. It's still three steps forward, one step back for the global warming agenda. And if a Democrat wins, we basically have lost the legislative battle at that point unless you can figure out a way to reverse the EPA regs through lawsuits, through defunding. But I don't think Republicans are that strong. So that's my solid, pessimistic note. Any well, <laughs> add to that that um, th look for especially in a Republican primary this is a winning issue for our side now uh, if you want to get if I were advising Republican presidential primary candidates say go right at the jugular of these wacko environmentalists and, and take I think the American people are looking for someone to take these people on uh, you know we need to now go on our yeah. side right <laughs> and, and, and I think that person is going to win the Republican nomination I love the comments um, and the comments about the success in oil and gas. I, I, I don't understand why we didn't have a national celebration. Things are so much better. The geopolitical situation is incredible. But my concern, and you mentioned it on the high school students, you know, look at the average age in here. You know, we don't have, oh, none of them like us. If you watch social media, <laughs> they have bought in completely. And even though we win today, every day, a bunch of us die and 10 more of them are showing up. <laughs> I, I agree with the union thing, but the youth thing, there's got to be something done. I mean. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The uh, kids, uh, if kids today are watching John Stewart. John Stewart just this week had a whole segment mocking and ridiculing and satirical and global warming skeptics. Yeah. Sign. Yeah. Maybe we're winning the culture after all. Well, I mean, my point is that's where they're getting their news from. And yeah. Polling shows the kids are probably the biggest believers, even though, ironically, every kid under 18 who marched on Sunday uh, has an experience an ounce of global warming in their life. But you mentioned labor unions. I just wanted to mention, we do it. There's a bright spot there. The Laborers International Union in North America represents half a million construction workers. Mm -hmm. The head of it is Terry O'Sullivan. He has come out. He, they've endorsed President Obama for presidency twice, but he now calls them gutless, yep. dirty, yep. and more. We have a major labor leader attacking Obama over the Keystone Pipeline and, and not doing it, and, there is a, and there's a huge backlash. If Republicans could reach out, we might get a, a labor endorsement from, a, you know, from the Laborers International Union. You know, I wrote a piece in the <coughs> Wall Street Journal uh, uh, last year because we had a big electric storm in, um, in Northern Virginia where I live, and so we were without electric power for three days. And some of you may have seen the article, it got a lot of attention. And I just basically, you know, I have three teenagers in my home. I don't like them very much, but they're still <laughs> there, you know. And so um, <laughs> they, uh, the first six hours was kind of fun. You know, you light the candles and da da da. And, you know, it's a really an adventure. By, by the next morning, uh, my, my kids were literally jumping off the walls. And, uh, no iPads, no iPhones, no TV, no computer, you know, e everything needs, and it was, a, it was a teachable moment for the kids because as I said, you know, well, you know, this is how people lived, you know, 100 years ago without electricity, and they're like, oh my God, I would have committed <laughs> suicide, you know, but how do we, uh, my point is, we have to find a way to connect the dots, you know. What we have to say to these young people is, you know, there, and by the way, this is no exaggeration. If you go forward with the green agenda and you try to power this $18 trillion economy, and, for, and correct me if I'm wrong, with windmills and solar power, you're going to have not just brownouts, you're going to have blackouts in this country. You're going to have, that's, that kind of thing is going to routinely happen. You can't, without coal burning fire plants and natural gas, you can't, wind and solar are, don't provide a reliable source of electricity. Some places they do, but, but right now they, they don't. And that's kind of the, that's one, I think, weakness that we can go after. 
do you re what do young people care the most about? Being able to be on social media and being on the iPads and, iPad and iPods and on, and to say, to connect the dots and say, this is powered by natural gas and coal, and this, the left is trying to take that away from you. Maybe, maybe we can win. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, just hopeful at all. <laughs> quick point: the Daily Telegraph in the UK, the UK power chief era of constant electricity at home is ending. Yeah. Fam quote: Families would have to get used to it only when when power is available. Unquote. And this is from Europe, where they've gone much further down the green road. This could be their future and our future. Era of constant electricity at home is ending. And that's John Holdren, the science advisor for Obama, said one of the great hazards facing a free society is energy that's too cheap too soon. He said this in 1976. Yeah. Part of their drink. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Mark. If you, I think America's got a, a great advantage in that Europe is ahead on this. And the, the, pl the energy policies of Germany, Spain, and now the UK are literally insane. Yeah. Uh, in Britain, uh, National Grid is going to pay businesses to close down when the wind doesn't blow. Uh, you know, it is that insane. And Britain has a major productivity pro problem, and you don't help that by having businesses close down. It's, a, it's actually, this is one of the great untold stories that our side has to get out there. It, you're exactly right. Europe is 10, 15 years ahead of us. They went all in on green energy 10 or 15 years ago. It, it is a catastrophe. I mean, Germany is a great example of this. I mean, I don't know how many of you have been kind of following this, but major German manufacturing companies like Volkswagen, like some of their major steel plants, and, and, other, and by the way, we always think of Germany as German engineering, you know, the best manufacturing in the world. A lot of these German companies are closing down factories in, the, in Germany, and guess where they're moving to? Yeah. United States. Yeah. They're insourcing jobs to the United States, and the reason they are doing this is because the electric power costs in the United States are about one-third what they are in, in Germany. So it's not like we have to imagine what would happen if we had a green energy future. We can see it. Germany and France and Spain tried it. And by the way, the German uh, economic minister said six months ago, this is a catastrophe for the jobs, for the, our unions, for our industries. We've got to move off gre green, green energy. What a lot of these, it's really fun thing about this, a lot of these com com uh, countries like Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Australia, not, guess what they want to do now? Frack. Yeah. They want to frack. They want to get in the game. And, you know, we're moving away from fracking just as soon as they're saying, wait a minute, this is the future. All and right. I think we have a thing to add sure. to that, Steve, yeah. which is sure. German CO2 emissions are going up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't even help their. Uh, it doesn't help. <laughs> I think we have another question in the back. I just really have a statement. I'm 30 and I'm in this room, and you say that I've learned so much from the intelligent and the generation in this room, and we're ready to get out there and we're ready to fight. And and be the opposite side. We just need the knowledge, and we just need the messaging, and we'll get it out there. Let me just add one thing, what Steve was saying about a strategy and a way to defeat him. One of the things we've let them get away with, and I was just at a Hill hearing with John Holdren two weeks ago. By the way, the electricity blinked off <laughs> during the hearing, and John Holdren was sitting there in a pitch black room. It went off for about almost a minute. <laughs> one of the things that we're missing is to pr hold them accountable. John Podesta goes on TV and says, we need to have a, uh, we need these EPA regulations because look at the storms. In other words, implying that the, the EPA regulations will impact future storminess. EPA regulations won't even impact global CO2 level, let alone global temperature, let alone global storms. So they're being saying, th this is the greatest threat we face, number one threat, and they're proposing pure symbolism right. as a solution. And the same with the UN, even if Kyoto had been fully implemented, I think Bjorn Lomberg had the best analysis that would have delayed the temperature we would have had in, you know, in 2100 by a few months or something like that with the emission reductions. It's all symbolism. That's what we need to hold them accountable for. Even if you accept their science for a moment, if you just want to reduce emissions, are these the way to go? Is this the way to go about it? And it turns out that this is all, you know, it's astrology at the end. It's witchcraft. The idea that the UN and Congress or EPA can legislate future temperatures of the earth or future storminess. A question right over here. Yes, um, Steve, uh, those were ex that's an excellent idea about appealing to the unions. Uh, what about the 47% or whatever Americans who get a government check? Don't those government checks, aren't they tied at all to the economy and the economy, of course, tied to this issue? Is there a, an argument there? Sorry, can you repeat, uh, repeat that question? I couldn't quite hear you. Well, the 47 percent are those who are receiving food stamps and other government welfare programs. How is that related to this energy dilemma 
Well, <laughs> that certainly is a big uh, problem that we've become a, a country with, uh, you know, we're, I think, at 48 percent right now. Um, but, look, I would simply say that the biggest lie, the, the lie to go after in this, in this green debate the left set up this really interesting um, thing about six years ago, right about the time Obama was elected. The, you, you know about this, the Blue-Green Alliance. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. And so they, they, these de some of these industrial unions got suckered into this idea that we're going to buy into the whole green energy revolution. And, and the deal that the Greens made with the unions was we're going to do solar power, we're going to do wind power and all these other things, and uh, they're all going to be union jobs, you know, eighty to $100,000 a year. Well, it was a crock, right? I mean, the green jobs never, uh, never emerged. And, and the point I'm making is the left, they're not stupid. These people are not stupid. They realized they had a problem in selling this stuff if it was going to cost American people jobs. So they created this whole, whole mythology of green jobs. You see, no, it's not. I mean, President Obama says this all the time, right? We're going to do this. It's not going to hurt the economy. It's going to help. They, they say it's going to help the economy, right? Yes. We're going to create more jobs by doing this. And that's kind of what we have to go after. Because you know what? If you look at the energy industry, the real energy industry, which is what people in Texas are doing and Oklahoma are doing or Pennsylvania are doing, those are the jobs that people want. Those are jobs that pay sixty, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars a year for a middle class, you know, worker. Those are really good jobs. And those are the ones that the left is trying to destroy. Yeah, and one note, Obama spent in a two thousand eleven analysis seventeen point two billion dollars to create thirty five hundred green jobs. <laughs> It came out to four point eight million dollars per job. That's a good That's return the kind on of investment. Subsidy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, when you look at uh, renewable energy, it's a highly capital intensive. It's money for this is profits for for green capitalists. It's not money for laborers, and that you don't That's create jobs point. with you don't cre and follow the money and see where the money's being made. All right, <laughs> we have time for one more question. Right here. I think um, part of the reason. We keep sending, uh, we have weak uh, Republicans, is because we keep sending politically connected people to Washington instead of uh, grassroots people. And it's not, it's not whether or what you believe, it's, it's who you know. You know, we, we have temporary politicians making permanent laws that hurt us forever. Yeah, uh, um, I may not be popular to say this, but the two Bush administrations, were some of the worst that could happen on the climate thing. The first Bush, George H.W. Bush, uh, signed the, Kyo uh, no, the Earth Summit Treaty, and that's actually the basis why Obama doesn't need to ratify, because they had the Earth Summit Treaty, the Sustainable Development back in 1992. He set forth the whole framework of the UN conference. The second Bush accepted the science, continued the funding of the UN, sent delegations every year to these UN conferences, played along with the game, kept the process alive, so, you know, he stopped cap and trade, but then so President Obama never got cap and trade either. That was never going to happen. So I think both Bushes have been very damaging as a Republicans when it came to the climate. They never stood up. They never stopped the funding. They never stood up to, the, to any of the science. They never articulated a position. In fact, in the face of especially the first George, the first George H.W. Bush was very damaging. He bought into all of that. So it's worrisome when you look at Romney, when you look at Christie. I don't even know about Jeb Bush. Uh, going forward, there's a lot of candidates out there that are very weak in this issue. A lot of good ones that are strong, too, as well. But you know, we, we don't have to be against renewable energy. And by, by the way, just, just an interesting thing. Do you all know um, what – there is one form of renewable energy, which is a really, really good source of electricity production. That pr hydropower. Right, Hy hydropower is a great source of electricity. In, in New York, you know, the city in Manhattan, they get a lot of their electricity from from Niagara Falls. It's a, it's a fantastic form of that emits no carbons in the environment. Guess what? They hate c hydropower too. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they hate hydropower? Because they, because of the fish. So think about this: they hate nuclear power, they hate hydropower, they hate oil, they hope, hate gas, they hate coal, they hate anything that works. Right? I mean, they were for natural gas until it started becoming cheap and efficient, and then they were <laughs> against it, right? Remember that? I yeah, mean, yeah. They, they said natural gas is great fuel when it was $12. When it was $4, hell no, we can't have this. So my point is I think we, we ought to do as a strategy as free market people, and you know, I think we're all free marketeers here, is simply say we're for whatever works, right? Get rid of every single – close down the Department of Energy. Close it down. Get rid of all the subsidies for all of these forms of energy, and let's, let, let's see what works. If solar and wind can work, 
fine. By the way, I was at an energy conference a few weeks ago with some of the leading experts, and I've always been a real skeptic on, I think wind is completely crazy, but I've always been a skeptic on solar, and these guys really convinced me we're maybe 15 or 20 years away from some incredible breakthroughs in, in solar power, which is really exciting. But it's 15 or 20 years away. What are we going to use for the next 15 yeah. or 20 years until those breakthroughs happen? And one last thing, if I may. You're so right. You know, we, th the problem with all these government subsidies, I would make the case all these $100 billion of subsidies that have gone to wind and solar, they've probably been done more damage to that industry because it just missed. Every time the government directs investment dollars, it goes in the wrong place. That industry would probably be further along if the government would just leave them alone, right? So let's be for a free market energy policy and no subsidies for anybody. Yeah, that's, right. that's a great way to end this panel. Please help me give a warm welcome to our panelists here. Um, and as, as we're leaving, we're going to show the trailer uh, for Mark's, for, was it Climate Depot? What's the name of the, yeah, the name of the, uh, yes, uh, Climate Hustle. Climate Hustle, all right. We're going to show the trailer of that and then um, we'll head out. Thank you all so much for being here. All right, thanks again, everyone.